Hi, I'm Anna Thomas, host of the Apple for the Teacher podcast. Let me tell you what it's about. So you might be thinking it's about reading, writing and arithmetic, right? Well, think again. It's a fresh take on true crime, where you wouldn't expect to find true crime. In schools, yes, schools. I will share with you the tragic and shocking stories I have uncovered in my own profession. You will hear stories about murder, abduction, school bus hijack, student disappearance, kidnap and ransom, school camp tragedy, the list goes on. But it's not all doom and gloom. As well as the bad apples, you will hear good apple stories as well, such as the teacher who uncovered sexual abuse in her school by the principal and the schoolboy who saved his classmates after their school bus was hijacked. So, if you're looking for something a little different in the true crime genre, then Apple for the Teacher is for you. So, I hope you can join me soon, but until then, remember to be a good apple. In these scary and difficult times, amidst a global pandemic that has affected every aspect of our lives, people are searching for helpers. Little do we know, they're everywhere. On every episode of the Hero Makers podcast, hosts Lori Nichols and Ann Chow have spirited discussions with a diverse lineup of guests on a wide variety of topics, including homelessness, human trafficking, mental health, race, culture, music, art, and many more. This month, they sat down with Darcy Olson, founder of Generation Justice, a nonprofit organization dedicated to mending the child protection system by helping children's court cases, changing laws and policies, and enforcing children's constitutional rights. With guests like these and many others, the Hero Makers podcast is both entertaining and essential. Follow the Hero Makers podcast on your favorite podcast platform and visit the Hero Makers Movement website by clicking the link in today's show notes. This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 55, Haas Benham. On March 11, 2014, a young woman and her older boyfriend entered the emergency room in Cullman, Alabama, carrying the lifeless body of her one-year-old son, Haas Benham, who they said had drowned in the bathtub of their mobile home. Haas's injuries did not match up with the couple's story, and after the results of an autopsy were released, both would face multiple charges, including capital murder and sexual torture. This is a story of a little boy who endured unfathomable cruelty at the hands of his mother and her boyfriend. It's also the story of a sweet, happy baby who died in terror and agony on his first birthday. This is the tragic story of Haas Benham. My sources for this week were The Coleman Tribune, the Dream and Demon Forums, Find a Grave, Heroes Wiki, Facebook, Fox 6 News, Life Post, The Daily Mail, Metro, Tulsa World, Mayo Clinic, Find Law, and the Coleman Caring for Kids website. I'd like to give a quick shout out to my newest patron, Megan from Round Lake, Illinois. Thank you so much, Megan. I'll include information on how to become a patron at the end of today's episode. I've covered stories before on the blog and the podcast of children whose mothers were so desperate for a man's love that they allowed their boyfriends or husbands to torture and kill their children. Immediately, two stories came to mind when I started researching this one. Scotty McMillan, the three-year-old Pennsylvania boy whose mother and her boyfriend were convicted and sentenced to prison for his 2014 torture, beating, and death. And two-year-old Stephen Meek II, who died in 2019 after allegedly being sexually abused, beaten, and tortured by his mother and her boyfriend, both of whom await trial on a laundry list of charges. 
It will never not be baffling and horrifying to me to hear a story in which a mother allows her boyfriend to perform the most heinous acts on her own child and, in some cases, actively participates. It's so outside the bounds of the expected maternal instinct that most of us can't comprehend what could possibly lead to such a decision being made. This is, unfortunately, one of those inexplicable stories. I usually rely on news coverage and any available court documentation to put together my episodes. For this episode, there wasn't a lot of media coverage or official documentation available, so I used public posts from the multiple Facebook accounts belonging to Haas's mother, Crystal Ballinger, to fill in a great deal of the background prior to his death. I wanted to mention that in case there are any inaccuracies in the early part of my telling of Haas's story. Also, I find that using some information and quotes from social media tends to add a more human element to the story that you might not otherwise get from sanitized news reports and sterile court documents. With all that said, let's get into it. This story, like many of those I cover on the podcast, begins with two young adults. Brody Wayne Benham was born in April of 1987. Crystal Violanda Ballinger was born in early January of 1991. By 2011, the two were a couple, and they moved into a trailer in Coleman, Alabama, in an area Crystal described as right by the vocational school. This may have been in the informally named Monk's Trailer Park, which was just around the corner from both Coleman County Vocational Center and the Coleman Area Technology Academy. Crystal's address would later be listed in court records as Unit 6 in this particular mobile home park, which was located at 17750 U.S. Highway 31. Going by some of the posts on Crystal's multiple Facebook accounts, she and Brody worked together, at least at one point. Crystal reportedly loved working with her man, and although it's unclear where they were working at the time, she mentioned working at fast food restaurants at various other times. According to her own words, Crystal hoped that someday she and Brody would be able to pull their finances together and have a child. That part happened unexpectedly and a lot sooner than they had hoped. By August of 2012, Crystal and Brody discovered they were expecting a baby, and they were quite excited about it. Crystal's family was evidently not quite as excited, which likely stemmed from the fact that the young couple wasn't exactly on solid financial footing at the time. Brody's family lived nearly 12 hours away in Oklahoma and Crystal's family was not in a position to continue bailing them out. One family member commented on a Facebook post in late 2012, Did you forget you screwed me out of $15, or do you even care? You know family ain't supposed to screw you over, but family must not mean anything to some people. To which Crystal replied with a rant about how hard things were for her financially, and that none of her family was helping her with money except her mom, Christine Welch, who tried to buy things to help Crystal prepare for the unborn baby as often as possible. The family member responded in part, if you couldn't afford a baby, you shouldn't have got pregnant in the first place. Birth control is free at the health clinic. In November of 2012, Crystal complained in a public Facebook post that she wished her family would be happy for her about being pregnant. She and Brody had just found out the month before that they were having a boy, and they fell in love with him from the moment they first saw their son in the ultrasound images. Crystal, who had dropped out of high school before graduating, lamented that she had finally earned her GED and was trying to get a better job, but it was hard. During her pregnancy, Crystal made more than one reference to wanting her body back to herself. In hindsight, it's hard not to wonder if she may have resented the baby, even then. At 10.16 a.m. on March 11, 2013, Haas Wayne Benham was born. Brody chose the baby's name after the character Eric Haas Cartwright from the long-running American Western TV series Bonanza, which Brody grew up watching. Actor Dan Blocker played the role of Haas Cartwright in 415 episodes of Bonanza, acting all the way until his untimely death in 1972 at the age of 43. The character of Haas was a large man who could be intimidating because of his size, but he was actually more of a gentle giant. Little Haas Benham weighed only 6 pounds at birth, measuring 18 and a half inches in length, but before long, he would grow to be a sturdy, beautifully chubby baby with dimples in all the right places, little baby sausage fingers, and cheeks that looked impossible not to want to pinch. Haas was beautiful and perfect, and he would live only 365 days. Everyone said Haas looked just like his daddy. Crystal described Brody as a very proud daddy and works his butt off to support both of us. I don't think y'all would even realize it was him anymore. He has changed so much since we have been together. Now, if only I can talk him into having a little girl, but we got plenty of time for that. 
Not everyone was a fan of the baby's name, judging by a post Crystal made on Facebook in May of 2013, reading, For all of those who don't want to call my son by his name, his name is Haas Wayne Benham, not just Wayne. I don't want him getting confused, so please call him by his given name, not just his middle name. I would really appreciate that. Thanks. After two months, Crystal returned to work from maternity leave, posting on May 20th, 2013, Well, being back at work isn't so bad. I figured it would be hard not spending so much time with my son, but I just want to work. Six weeks is a long time, and I rarely ever got out of the house. I'm actually back in with the rest of the world now, and it feels good that all the time I spend away from him can be made up for, or at least I hope. He is just such a mama's boy, though. At two months old, Haas received his first inoculations, and he had already grown significantly, weighing in at 10.6 pounds and measuring 22 inches in length. He had been diagnosed with thrush, and the medication he was prescribed made him sleepy, but it certainly didn't stunt his growth. By June 1st, he weighed 12 pounds, and by August, just before he reached the five-month mark, he was up to 16 pounds and measuring at 25 inches long. He is growing so fast, he is only going to get heavier. Guess Mama will finally have muscles in her arms. God, I love being a mother. Just don't like having to wake up at six every morning. They never let you sleep in, lol. Of her son, Crystal wrote, He is so cute, and I love his smile. Financially, Crystal and Brody continued to struggle. Around September of 2013, Crystal lost her job, and while she looked for another, she begged for help from family and friends. On October 9, 2013, Crystal wrote on Facebook, Not having a home is hard, but maybe I'll make it and be able to do better. In the comments of her own post, apparently responding to no one, she wrote, At least now I have a place to stay and food to eat. It's unclear if she and Brody were still together by this time. In December, things apparently took a turn for the worse, as Crystal posted in all caps, Help, please PM me if you want to know more, I'm desperate. Followed by 14 exclamation points. A few days later, she wrote, Desperate, just lost my cars, about to lose my house. Was trying to get jobs, but now we can't because we have no ride. Please help, I have no one to help. Despite the family's difficulties, Haas continued meeting his developmental milestones and growing like a weed. He sat up on his own for the first time just before he turned eight months. By nine months, Haas had grown into a perfectly healthy, chubby baby with little dimples everywhere, fine blonde hair, twinkling blue eyes, and a wide smile, showing off the first of his little white teeth. By all accounts, Haas was quick to show off that smile. He was described as always happy and always smiling. Everyone who met him loved him. By the beginning of 2014, Crystal and Brody's relationship ended for good. Around this time, she and Haas moved in with a 37-year-old man named Jeffrey Brown, who also went by Jeff and, during the years he lived in Florida, Jeffy. If my interpretation of the facts is correct, my best guess is that Jeff was a neighbor in the same mobile home park, living just a few lots over from Crystal and Brody's trailer. When 23-year-old Crystal announced she was desperate for help and a place to live, Jeff may have taken her and Haas in, but if their relationship began platonically, it wouldn't stay that way for long. Near the end of January of 2014, Crystal posted on Facebook, When life brings you down and you think everyone is against you, God will always put someone in your life to make it all better. Along with that adage, she also posted two photos, individual shots of her and Jeff. Less than two weeks later, one of Crystal's various Facebook accounts trumpeted a life event in a relationship with Jeff Brown. At the same time, she made a photo of Jeff, her profile cover picture. Despite the grand announcement of her new relationship, however, things were not as rosy as they initially seemed. In late February and early March of 2014, Crystal wrote multiple angsty Facebook posts alluding to trouble in paradise. Among her emotional commentary was a post on February 28th reading, So happy but so sad at the same time. Is that even possible? Man, how does this always happen? On March 1st, she wrote, How can I prove I'm not what you think I am? On March 2nd, she posted, What am I to do? I have fallen in love with him, but he doesn't believe me. I can't seem to do anything right anymore. To me, these are the ruminations of a woman desperate to earn the affections of her love interest, who was significantly older than her. Crystal, a pale, plain-faced young woman with brown hair and hazel eyes hidden behind wire-rimmed glasses, may have thought Jeff was the best she could do. Jeff, a short man with a greasy, dirty blonde ponytail, blue eyes, a ruddy complexion, and a graying goatee, was certainly no prize but for whatever reason, Crystal was fixated on keeping him, which undoubtedly had everything to do with the depth she was willing to reach to keep him happy. 
Tuesday, March 11, 2014, was Haas Wayne Benham's first birthday. Just two days before, his mother posted several pictures on Facebook from his birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese, which was attended by several friends and family members. March 11th should have been a special day for the special little guy. He should have spent his day being spoiled and smothered with hugs and kisses, smashing his hands into his birthday cake and smearing frosting all over his face and playing with his new toys. Instead, we now know that Haas spent his entire first birthday, as well as a good portion of the previous day, in terror and agony. At around 11 p.m. on March 11, 2014, Crystal Ballinger and Jeffrey Brown entered Cullman Regional Medical Center with Haas's lifeless body, claiming the newly minted one-year-old had accidentally drowned in the bathtub of the family's mobile home on Route 31. By the time medical staff got to him, it was too late. Little Haas was pronounced dead on arrival. There were multiple injuries on Haas's body that were not consistent with the story given by Crystal and Jeff, so, knowing something was very wrong, hospital staff contacted the Coleman County Sheriff's Office, which dispatched a deputy to the hospital to investigate. The deputy, after receiving an initial assessment from the medical staff and viewing the baby's injuries for himself, called for a team of investigators to respond to both the hospital and the home. Haas's injuries included excessive bruising all over his body, including his head, neck, stomach, and back. Some of the bruises were yellowish, while others were fresher. The baby had also suffered a fractured skull. Quickly, investigators isolated 23-year-old Crystal Ballinger and 37-year-old Jeffrey Brown and secured interviews with each of them. Crystal initially told the officers that she had been giving Haas a bath when he went underwater, inadvertently sucking some into his lungs. She said when she pulled him out, water came out of his mouth, although she insisted Haas appeared to be fine until, shortly afterward, Jeff found him not breathing. Jeff's story was markedly different. He initially told investigators that when he arrived home from work on March 11th, Crystal was cooking while Haas was in the tub. When he first checked on the baby, Jeff said, he was fine, but when he went back to check on Haas again, not long after that, he found Haas slumped under the water. Jeff told police he pulled Haas out of the tub and got water out of his stomach by pushing on him. He said Haas was breathing fine until he suddenly threw up some water, and at that point, they brought him to the hospital. Neither Crystal nor Jeff could explain the mosaic of bruises covering Haas's little body. Two days after Haas's death, on the evening of Thursday, March 13, 2014, 37-year-old Jeffrey Hugh Brown was arrested and charged with aggravated child abuse, a Class B felony in Alabama. He was held at the Coleman County Detention Center on a $30,000 cash bond. A police report later stated that Jeff's arrest was based on the suspect's initial interviews with lead investigators Bethany Shadricks and Captain John Montgomery, as well as other physical evidence uncovered by investigators during the course of the investigation. The following day, 23-year-old Crystal Violanda Ballinger was arrested on the same charge and detained in the same facility. Coleman County Sheriff Mike Rainey said in a press release on March 14th, the Coleman County Sheriff's Office was notified by Coleman Regional Medical Center of a reported bathtub drowning of a one-year-old child, Haas Wayne Benham. The initial medical review indicated that the child's body had several external injuries that were suspicious in nature. This case is still very active and ongoing at this time, and we are not at liberty to discuss details or specifics that could jeopardize our investigation. I want to commend all the officers and investigators for their hard work and dedication in uncovering the facts surrounding this investigation. The Coleman County Sheriff's Office is working closely with the District Attorney's Office and the Department of Human Resources. We anticipate making further progress in this investigation in the near future. Child abuse cases are difficult to work, and especially those which result in the death of a child. As Sheriff, I am saddened by the death of this little boy, and I want the community to know that we are praying for this child and those who loved him. Neighbors of the family were shaken by Haas's death. One woman, Madonna Hildebrandt, told a reporter, you want to put it in the back of your mind, this is not happening, it's really not happening, and then it's reality, it has. She said she had never heard anything out of the ordinary at the home, but that Jeff's behavior the day after Haas died was concerning. Like he went to work the day after and, you know, acted like nothing ever happened, and nobody could figure out, why would you go to work? You know, that doesn't make sense. Why wouldn't you comfort the woman you're supposed to love and care for the baby? It was reported elsewhere that while Jeff was at work that day, Crystal went and got her hair done. Another neighbor, Tanya Biesinger, told the reporter, It's horrible. It's horrible. It's hard to know that somebody you know, something like that could happen. Fox 6 News spoke with Jeff's niece, Brittany Thomas, who insisted of her uncle, He's a good man, and there's no way he was capable of killing a one-year-old baby on his birthday. 
He's not that kind of man. He's not. With all the video conferencing and virtual meetings going on these days, we all want to look our best. If you're like me, you're probably confused by all the different methods of teeth whitening on the market. Now that I'm partnering with Smile Brilliant, I've learned a few things that you might find helpful about home teeth whitening methods. For example, LED lights are a novelty item. Whitening strips neglect the gum lines, crevices, and molars. Charcoal is abrasive and wears down your enamel. And whitening toothpaste only works on surface stains. So if none of these miracle products really works, what does? The number one product recommended by dentists is the custom-fitted tray, which usually costs an arm and a leg because they require a dentist to make them by hand using a model of your teeth. With Smile Brilliant's Lab Direct process, you can get custom-fitted teeth whitening trays at a fraction of the price without a single visit to the dentist. Using an exact model of your teeth, Smile Brilliant's lab technicians will handcraft your trays to give you the best possible whitening results. All you have to do is visit smilebrilliant.com, and when you order their system, make sure you use the coupon code CHILDREN at checkout for 30% off. When you receive the package from Smile Brilliant, it's really simple. You just make your dental impressions at home and return them using the prepaid envelope they provide you. In a matter of one week, Smile Brilliant will have your trays back in the mail. Using my coupon code, CHILDREN, means you're supporting me while saving a huge amount of money. So check out smilebrilliant.com today. Coleman County District Attorney Wilson Blaylock authorized Haas's body to be taken to the State Department of Forensic Sciences facility in Huntsville, Alabama, where an autopsy was conducted on March 13, 2014, by Dr. Valerie Green. Although Haas's cause of death was not immediately released, the autopsy did unearth a slew of horrific details that stunned the community. According to a sworn affidavit written by Coleman County Sheriff's Office investigator Bethany Shadricks, who attended the examination along with Chief Deputy Max Bartlett, one-year-old Haas had been forcibly held underwater in addition to suffering punishment by hot sauce in his mouth in the days leading up to his death. The baby had endured an unfathomable level of physical abuse prior to his death, which was undoubtedly merciful when it finally came. Haas had suffered a skull fracture and bruising on the back of his head, as well as numerous bruises, both old and new, all over his body. There were burns on the bottom of both feet and cuts inside his mouth, in addition to blunt force trauma to his head and face, bruising to his scrotum, and rectal tearing consistent with sexual abuse. For obvious reasons, Dr. Green ruled the manner of Haas's death a homicide. In her affidavit, investigator Shadricks wrote, Crystal stated she witnessed Jeff Brown giving Haas Tabasco sauce as punishment to make him stop crying. Crystal stated on the night of March 11, 2014, Jeff was giving Haas a bath and she walked into the bathroom and witnessed Jeff holding Haas underwater for 20 to 25 seconds. Jeff told Crystal he was teaching Haas how to float and that he could hold his breath. Shadricks continued, saying Crystal said Jeff performed CPR on Haas, who seemed fine after water came out of his mouth. The pair put Haas to bed, she told police, and later found him not breathing normally. Crystal added that she would sometimes give Haas cough medicine because he was cutting teeth. Months earlier on Facebook, when Haas was tiny, Crystal asked for advice for teething. Someone suggested a frozen water bottle, while someone else recommended she rub whiskey on his gums. Apparently, she found her own tried-and-true method, drugging the poor kid. Court records indicated Crystal admitted she and Jeffrey used methamphetamine on Sunday, March 9th, and Monday, March 10th, prior to Haas's death on Tuesday, and then again on Wednesday night, after he died. Court-ordered drug tests confirmed these claims. Crystal tested positive for marijuana, methamphetamine, amphetamines, and MDMA, or ecstasy, while Jeff tested positive for benzodiazepines, methamphetamine, amphetamines, and MDMA. Records also show that investigators interviewed Jeff's teenage daughter, who evidently lived in the home, in the early morning hours of Wednesday, March 12th. Regarding the burns on Haas's feet, the girl said he may have been burned a few weeks prior, while walking over heating vents in the floor, or stepping on a tack. Crystal had reported that her son had just started learning to walk and could only do so by holding on to things, so this story was obviously less than credible. You can hardly blame the young girl for trying to protect her father, however. The teen added that she didn't notice any bruises on Haas while giving him a bath the day before he died, directly contradicting the medical examiner's findings of bruises in varying degrees of healing. She also said her father, for whatever reason, insisted on staying in the bathroom with the baby when he was given baths. 
Haas's funeral took place on Monday, March 17, 2014, at the Moss Service Funeral Home Chapel, officiated by the Reverend Chuck Kennedy. Afterward, Haas was laid to rest in the East Point Cumberland Presbyterian Cemetery in Cullman. His obituary stated that Haas left behind his parents, Brody and Crystal, as well as grandparents, Glenn and Christine Welch, and Diane and Anthony Benham, and great-grandparents Myrtle and James Doss. Haas's great-grandmother, Myrtle, wrote in an online memorial for the smiley little boy, He was my first great-grandson, and I miss him every single day, and he is always on my mind. I look to heaven every night and tell him good night because I know he is in heaven, and he watches over us all. I love you and miss you, and I miss that beautiful smile that was always on your face. From your great Nana. In early April, Jeff's attorney at the time, David McWhorter, filed a motion with the court to lower his client's bond from $30,000 cash to $15,000, and Judge Kim Cheney granted the motion. Quickly, Cullman County Assistant District Attorney Jeff Roberts filed a motion seeking the reconsideration of the bond reduction on the grounds that Jeffrey Hugh Brown was a flight risk. According to the motion, Jeff, who had previously lived in Florida, had several prior felony convictions and a history of failing to appear for previous court proceedings. In addition, he had lost his previous home in Cullman, and his landlord claimed that he did not, in fact, have custody of his daughter at that time. Roberts wrote in the motion, The defendant has a substantial felony record in the state of Florida for crimes dealing with larceny and trafficking in stolen property. The defendant also has a previous charge in the state of Florida for escape, fugitive from justice. Since the defendant has multiple prior felonies, he is looking at a possible sentence of life in the current case. Furthermore, the defendant has a history of fleeing the jurisdiction and being a fugitive from justice in cases involving more property crimes, and is an even greater risk to flee in the case due to the potential sentence and nature of the crime. Within a few days, the original bond of $30,000 was reinstated, with Judge Cheney citing the previous misrepresentation of facts to the court as her reason for the initial reduction. Anyone who's heard this podcast before knows that from time to time I tend to rant about topics that strike a particular nerve with me for one reason or another. Today's tangent is brought to you by a nonprofit organization in the Coleman area, and I'll explain why. First, however, I want to make it perfectly clear that I think Coleman Caring for Kids, or CCK, is an incredibly worthy organization that does amazing work, including food drives, fundraisers, and awareness campaigns. They train CASA workers or court appointed special advocates who are trained volunteers assigned to specific cases by courts to act in a child's best interests. In April of 2015, a year after Haas's death, CCK organized a gathering of advocates and supporters who collected around the local courthouse to pray before walking to another location for the next phase of the gathering. CCK's 2015 walk began with the handing out of white crosses, each of which bore the name of one of the 18 children killed in Alabama that year from abuse and neglect. Coleman County Sheriff Matt Gentry attended the event to remember the lost children and the struggles faced daily by abused children, a struggle he said law enforcement knew all too well. It's an issue that we have to face every day as law enforcement officers. It is something that is near and dear to our hearts, and we just keep on every day trying to educate the public. Events like today are important to educate people because our goal is to stop child abuse. Javon Daniel, the director of CCK, gave an emotional speech atop the parking deck at Coleman Savings Bank. Child abuse happens every minute of every day, right here in our community. It's not in a far-off place, it's right here, and last year there were 849 cases of child abuse reported to DHR in Coleman. In Alabama, 18 children have died, and that is why we are releasing these balloons. This is to remember those who have died, those who are still victims, and those who are survivors. The important thing about today is that children are abused, and the only people who can do something about it is us. After the speech, 100 balloons, blue to represent the bruises suffered by abused children, were released. The balloons were also intended as a sign of hope for any child that is suffering. CCK organized another balloon release for the same reason in 2019. First of all, anyone who's listened to this podcast for any length of time knows how strongly I feel about balloon releases, which are catastrophically dangerous to wildlife and the environment. I know they're almost always done with the best of intentions, but you know what they say about the road to hell being paved with those. In no way is it a good idea to release a bunch of trash into the air only for it to fall back to earth or into a body of water to choke, bind, or otherwise harm animals. Visit balloonsblow.org for more information and other ideas on meaningful and safe ways to memorialize lost children. 
There's absolutely nothing wrong with symbolic gestures like candlelight vigils or gatherings promoting awareness. All I'm saying is that if you're going to do something symbolic, at the very least, do something that's not harmful. Another thing, obviously I'm all for raising awareness of child abuse, advocating for children, and making a difference. It's commendable that people want to stop child abuse, but realistically, that will never happen. Humans are violent animals. Unfortunately, someone, somewhere, will always abuse their children. However, what we can do is intervene when we suspect it's happening. We can promote education to teach people life skills and coping mechanisms for frustration. We can campaign for legislative changes to better our mental health system and offer more support for single, needy, addicted, or mentally ill parents. We can raise money for organizations dedicated to preventing child abuse or supporting and advocating for abused children. Even if we can't stop child abuse altogether, we can prevent its escalation and we can intervene to save abused children. To do that, it's important to understand the various types of child abuse and the signs to watch for. I have gone over this information before, but it's always worth mentioning again, especially as we're poised to enter April, which is National Child Abuse Prevention Month. I'll include a link to this information in the show notes for today's episode as well. According to the Mayo Clinic, there are five types of child abuse. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, medical abuse, and neglect. The signs of child abuse may vary depending on the type of abuse the child is suffering or the child's age and other factors. But some signs a child is being abused are withdrawal from friends or activities, changes in behavior or school performance, depression, anxiety, unusual fears, and loss of self-confidence, an apparent lack of supervision, frequent school absences, reluctance to leave school activities or friends' houses as if they don't want to go home, attempts to run away, rebellious or defiant behavior, self-harm or suicide attempts, unexplained injuries or injuries that don't match the explanation given, inappropriate sexual behavior or knowledge for the child's age, pregnancy or sexually transmitted infections, blood in a child's underwear, inappropriate sexual contact with other children, delayed or inappropriate emotional development, avoidance of certain situations, desperately seeking affection, regression in developmental skills like potty training, being significantly under or overweight, poor hygiene, ill-fitting or inappropriate clothing, taking food or money without permission, hoarding food, or a lack of appropriate medical, dental, or psychological care. Abusive parents, too, can show signs or red flags, such as showing little concern for their child, failure to recognize physical or emotional distress in their child, blaming the child for problems, belittling or berating the child with negative terms, expecting the child to fulfill the parent's need for affection, attention, or care, being jealous of the child, paying attention to anyone else, excessive or harsh physical discipline, demanding an inappropriate or impossible level of physical or academic performance, severely limiting the child's time with others, and offering unconvincing explanations for a child's injuries. While many of us fall into some of the below categories, these can be considered risk factors, not surefire indicators, of a potentially abusive parent. A history of being abused or neglected themselves as a child, physical or mental disability or illness, stress within the family, domestic violence, marital conflicts, single parenting, having at least one child in the family who's developmentally or physically disabled, financial stress, unemployment, or poverty, social or extended family isolation, abuse of alcohol, drugs, or other substances, and a general lack of parenting skills. Again, I'll include a link in the show notes to the Mayo Clinic webpage that lists complications, prevention tips, and other resources. This is by no means a comprehensive list, and the most important thing to remember is that old saying, if you see something, say something. The case dragged on for several years. Sadly, on June 14, 2015, Haas's paternal grandmother, Diana Lynn Benham, passed away in Oklahoma at the age of 50. Two months later, in August of 2015, the results of Haas's autopsy were released, and I promise you're not ready for this. This sweet, happy, one-year-old baby suffered 89 separate injuries prior to his death, including 38 blunt force injuries to the head and neck, four injuries each to his left and right eyes, 19 injuries to his arms and legs, 
six injuries to his torso, seven injuries to his genitalia and anus, and seven burns to his right foot and four to his left. Coleman County District Attorney Wilson Blaylock and his staff reviewed the autopsy report for two days before deciding to seek capital murder charges against both defendants when a grand jury convened the week of October 6th. The district attorney told a reporter, It's really unbelievable and just hard to read what happened to this infant child. His last 36 hours were spent in horror and pain. With the victim being under 14 and the findings of this autopsy, we are moving forward with the capital murder charges on both Ballinger and Brown. It takes you aback to think that anyone could cause these types of injuries to a child. It was only at this point that Haas's case received any press coverage outside of the Cullman County area. News media from all over the world ran the story of the baby who died in horror and pain on his first birthday. After the fuss had died down, the story sadly faded back into obscurity outside the local coverage. In August of 2015, Haas's great aunt, Holly Doss Tucker, who was the sister of Crystal's mother, Christine, started a GoFundMe to raise $990 for a headstone for Haas. They nearly doubled their goal in two days and were able to purchase a beautiful grave marker, which was placed in October of the same year. Haas's final resting place is now marked by a stone in the shape of a crescent moon with a photo of Haas embedded near the top, below which are inscribed the words Haas Wayne Benham, March 11, 2013 to March 11, 2014. A little cherub figure rests in the curve of the moon, watching over Haas for eternity. Also in October of 2015, the Coleman County Grand Jury indicted both Crystal Ballinger and Jeffrey Brown on charges of sexual torture, capital murder of a child, and capital murder during sexual abuse. Charges of capital murder carried a sentence of either life in prison without parole or the death penalty, which Blaylock said he intended to seek in at least Jeff's case, if not Crystal's as well. Both defendants were ordered to undergo mental evaluations as their separate defense teams planned their strategies. The exams were administered by the Alabama Department of Mental Health, and both were ultimately deemed competent to stand trial. Jeff's defense team filed a motion with the court to forbid anyone connected to his case from releasing information to or discussing it with the media. They made a motion to the court in December of 2015 for Circuit Judge Martha Williams to impose an order prohibiting all attorneys, parties, witnesses, law enforcement personnel, and court personnel who are connected to the prosecution or investigation of this case from extrajudicially releasing information in any form to any agent or employee of any news media concerning any aspect of these proceedings. The case dragged on longer than most, with little to no progress evidently made for the next three and a half years. In July of 2019, Crystal submitted a handwritten request for the removal and replacement of her court-appointed attorney, Melvin Hastings, although it does not appear her request was granted. By December of that year, she was still represented by Hastings, although another attorney named Michael Haynes was also added to the mix. Jeff's trial had been scheduled for August of 2019, but at a hearing on August 6th, it was once again adjourned to a later date at the request of the defense. At this point, it had been almost four years since Jeff was indicted and over five years since Haas's death. There would, however, be no trial. On Friday, December 13, 2019, 43-year-old Jeffrey Hugh Brown, represented by attorneys Sarah Baker and Joshua O'Neill, pleaded guilty before Coleman County Circuit Judge Martha Williams to a single charge of felony murder, reduced from capital murder and thereby taking the death penalty off the table. As a result of accepting this plea agreement, Jeff's charges of aggravated child abuse, capital murder involving sexual abuse, and sexual torture were dismissed, and he was sentenced on the spot to 40 years in prison, less the five years, ten months, and one day he had served in the Coleman County Detention Center. Less than a week later, on Thursday, December 19, 2019, 28-year-old Crystal Violanda Ballinger accepted the same plea deal pleading guilty to felony murder before Circuit Court Judge Gregory Nicholas and receiving the same 40-year sentence less time served. Her other charges were also dismissed. If I'm not mistaken, this means neither of them will have to register as a sexual offender when they are released. Before Jeff was ultimately transferred out of the Cullman County Detention Center to serve his term in state prison, he was charged on December 26, 2019 with first-degree promoting prison contraband a Class C felony in Alabama in which an inmate or anyone else within a prison facility possesses, makes, or provides another inmate with any deadly weapon, instrument, tool, or other thing which may be useful for escape. Good to know he's behaving himself from day one. 
Jeffrey Hugh Brown, AIS number 00321883, is currently incarcerated in the Bibb County Correctional Facility, a medium security prison for men in Brent, Alabama. His earliest release date is listed on the Alabama Department of Corrections website as August 28, 2055, with no parole consideration date cited. Crystal Violanda Ballinger, AIS number 00322271, resides in the Julia Tutwiler Prison for Women in Wetumpka, Alabama, also a medium security facility. Her minimum release date is listed as August 31, 2055, although she does have a parole consideration date listed of September 1, 2030. Haas's maternal great-aunt Holly wrote her sister, Christine, a poignant memory of her precious great-nephew, which Christine later shared on Facebook. Let me give you a memory because his life should be celebrated. My daughter may be kindergarten or first grade. She and Haas were playing, and they get quiet. We all know they are up to something. When we find them, they are in the cabinet eating white chocolate Oreos, and that baby had chocolate in his hair, in his eyebrows, laughing and crushing the cookies and eating them by the fistfuls. I sit down with them, and he fed me and my daughter till we were sick of sweetness. We put him beside the sink because there was no way that big man fit in the sink, and we washed the cookie away as he laughed. Comfort is hard to find, but the memory of his laugh and smile is all we have now. Haas's family only had the privilege of celebrating a single birthday with their precious boy before he was torn from their arms, and his memory is all they have left. At the very least, we can help them keep Haas's memory alive. Rest well, little guy. You will always be remembered. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another case. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com, where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod, and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCPod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, Hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by Dream Note Music, and all music for the show is licensed from audiojungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to suffer the little children pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.